Okay, I'm the next speaker, so I will introduce myself. I'm Cecilia Mascoli, University of Cambridge. Um, I work on mobile systems in general, and uh, in, the, in this presentation, my aim is to give you an example of three um, areas uh, that I've been working on, and they could could be the point of contact with the Alan Turing Institute um, and, and on how, how things, uh, you know, if it, we might find some uh, interaction points here. So it's really about mobile sensing and data and applications. Uh, we often um, write um, software to gather data to make the gathering of the data more efficient for, with mobile devices. And then we use uh, we, we devise analysis techniques to uh, make the analysis more um, specific and optimized for this kind of uh, very fine grained temporally and spatially um, data uh, sets. And then we use the logic that we um, we have generated to uh, improve recommendations, improve applications. And here are a couple of applications that uh, we looked at. So um, my first slide is an, uh, an animation. So uh, I'll start with this data. This, this data is collected from uh, Foursquare, which is uh, a platform similar to Facebook that allows people to tell their friends where they are. So I can check in the Alan Turing and tell my friends where, where, uh, where I am. Uh, we have used this data um, in, in a way that I will explain, in various ways. And I, I will have one case study I will describe, but at first, thought of uh, showing you an animation of the data with, um, this is New York at various stages uh, during the day, the, the, the size of uh, the, check, the, the, the circles indicate how many people are checking in in that particular location, the colors indicate the semantics, so we have semantics of location, parks, uh, stations, um, universities, um, what else is there? Museums uh, and, and, and the different times you can see that the city is used in a different way. Um, what have we done with this type of data? This is a list of, um, of works uh, that I'm not going to go into detail um, of, but uh, that could we could have worked on with, with the data you just saw uh, because the data has information about friendship. So we have a social network there and we have a geographical network, we have a space network, a place network. Um, the two are quite powerful and you can, you can look at a number of things. You can look at communities in space and evolution and the user space of groups, uh, place recommendation, role of placey, participation in events and gathering, human mobility models. And we've done, if you go on my webpage, you, you will find um, looking at these words, perhaps, hopefully, you'll find the right papers. I will concentrate uh, for uh, some minutes on this work on urban network analysis using multi-layer network models. Um, and we have targeted there some uh, gentrification concepts. The data we use for this uh, particular study is a data set, again, um, it's the Foursquare data that we collect. In this particular case, we've collected it through a crawl through Twitter, which means we have the Twitter social network and the Foursquare place network. So we have two networks there, a bunch of numbers. This is just for London, um, but, but the numbers are quite big. Uh, so we have a place network, we have check-ins of places like you've seen in the animation, and we have the social network of people connected. So you can imagine something um, that can be abstracted away like this. You have your social network, your place network, where you have somehow these transitions that are defined by the check-ins of people that go before from one place to the next. And of course, this person might visit this location, Alan Turing, and then the computer lab in Cambridge, and whatever else is home, or the residence, particular residence, particular cafe. And, and so, so the network is like that, so a user um, has a group of locations that it visits. And these locations happen to also have some uh, links which are defined by which, which person goes first from this place to this place. In the same way, a place corresponds to a group of users and these users might or might not have a link. Roughly and very quickly, this is the idea. One thing we have found, and if you're interested, this is a reference to the paper you find on my webpage, is a dub 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 2016 paper, where we linked these concepts of, um, in this particular case, we came up with a bunch of measures, but this is a concept of brokerage. 
can a place be brokering um, between users that have perhaps a diverse set of uh, connections among them? So brokering in social network is a concept. Uh, you are a broker if you are connecting friends that are not connected with each other. So if you are, it's kind of a bridge between them. So we use this concept um, in the two networks to um, find some information, some useful information for urban analytics. And in this particular case, just by giving you a picture, uh, we kind of look at brokerage rank and a rank of deprivation of the neighborhoods in London. And we found some interesting properties, uh, just as a glimpse, one interesting property is that we could already see in the data that the broker which was a good, a good um, alternative um, measure for uh, deprivation, but also uh, for the change of deprivation. So um, the IMD rank um, was measured in 2011 and 2015. And in 2015, um, a neighborhood like Hackney moved from position second to position 11. And in the data already, using these brokerage models, we could foresee that Hackney was changing. We would, we would see this change in the brokerage level of the data. So that was uh, an interesting result from, you know, network analysis data uh, could tell us something about um, some urban properties of, of, the, of the environment. So this is, as I said, that there's more in, in, in this particular paper. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of work um, in, in this domain, but um, for this particular kind of work, I will stop here and I'll go forward on another two types of, um, of work that we've done uh, with mobile data and mobile technology. So the second one is um, a work on um, office analytics. Um, office analytics uh, are important. We work with uh, the Bartlett School here in um, UCL uh, to try to uh, understand how people use space and how face-to-face uh, -face interactions happen in, in this sort of environments um, and how we can perhaps foster them with, with space. We've used a variety of tags and in fact we hope to do a study in the Alan Turing uh, hopefully in the next month or two with a, with a different kind of technology. Uh, I can tell you a little bit more. This is um, just a simple beacon tag that generates beacons um, every, every, let's say, I, I won't give you detail, every now and then. And uh, for the fact that it was worn in front in, on the chest um, means that the body kind of um, avoids screens all the waves from the back. So um, really, this was able to detect face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, we also tried to use, uh, we manufactured this. Um, this is, inside there, there is a Bluetooth uh, device with also an accelerometer. And uh, with the idea there, we put it on a brace to try to see if um, the technology could also, at some point, go into um, mobile devices already existing, such as uh, wristwatches, smartwatches. So we have a, a number of technologies we are trying. We're trying another one that is now possibly able to detect the angle. And uh, that, that's the one we're developing right now. Um, I'll give you just a hint of the kind of, uh, you know, developing the tags is an issue, but really uh, we are developing the tags to get accurate data about people's interactions and behavior. Um, and this is a glimpse of an interesting study that uh, was done uh, when Microsoft Research in Cambridge moved from one building to a different building. Um, and so this is the, it, it, it's easy, well, let's understand how this works. It's kind of easy to, un to, to understand. These are people, every ID is a person, ordered um, by groups. So they're clustered by groups. So the first, let's say the first um, seven are in one group, a uh, research group, the next, five or six are in another group, and uh, the final uh, ten, about ten, are in another research group. Um, what we see here is um, lighter colors for less interaction, darker colors for more interaction. So the tags detect these sort of interactions, we aggregate all these interactions, and um, put them on a matrix that shows somehow the interactions within groups and between groups. Well, we, a, a simple, this is very simple analysis somehow, um, shows that 
the new building had more interaction within groups. And by looking at what happened there, we looked at um, location tags and how, uh, where these interactions were happening and how um, the, the result was that there, were, there was a better distribution of the space and there was a cafeteria that was embedded in the new space that wasn't existing there and, and it fostered that. We looked at something I'm not showing here, uh, we looked at community um, analysis, community detection uh, me network metrics um, to look at the level of uh, modularity, for example, of the different environments and in fact show, this showed that there was a higher modularity here than, than it was here. Um, uh, so this, this was um, the in, this was the impact, sorry, I should have written it there, the impact of floors, um, I'll, I'll take questions at the end if you don't mind. The impact of floors uh, over the interactions between the groups. And one thing that became uh, quite evident was that by moving a group that was um, on a different floor, all of a sudden, all the other groups were interacting much more than they were before. I won't, I won't um, spend time describing too much of the of the of the exact results there, but you could study how people at different floors would interact. So it's really about space and interactions, but it could just be about using the data for interactions. Of course, uh, another study we are doing is about hot desking and how um, you know th these studies um, architects often study these things by placing their PhD students in an environment and, and making them survey what people are doing in that environment. That's very costly and uh, it doesn't scale up, neither in time or in the number of people to be observed. In, in addition, it doesn't scale up at all when you have an environment like the Alan Turing where people can choose their desk dynamically. Um, so we're trying to use technology for this sort of studies and have a bit more information. Um, other studies that have been um, done uh, by MIT before have shown that people, well, why is social interaction, imp that's one question I was asked, why is social interaction so important in, in, um, in, in office environments? They've shown that um, people in a call set, there, was, there were people in a call center and the people that were they seem to be time wasters, really, because they, they took coffee breaks, they were talking to people. They were the most efficient one because they were harvesting information of how well others were doing and how well um, they, were, they were managing to convince customers, perhaps, to, to sell, uh, to, to buy products. So um, this level of interaction is important for, for office um, performance. Um, the last project I want to talk about is one related to mental health. Um, we have uh, used uh, mobile phones uh, in various ways to uh, collect large quantities of data about people's um, psychology and mood and try to, the idea, that the goal here is to find technological biometrics for mental health. So can we relate mood reports that could be reported just by you placing uh, your, your finger on one of these quadrants and say that perhaps you're very happy and very excited today or perhaps you're very sad and very, very calm. Um, relate that sort of state with your activity. The fact that perhaps today you're not calling anyone, you're not moving much, you're visiting the user location, so your behavior can kind of be the signature of, of your um, of your status of mind. We, we, we put out an application um, that was doing exactly that, detected passive sensing from any sensors that we have on a phone, but also every now and then during the day detecting, um, asking the user to fill questionnaires as a sort of ground truth. Uh, we expect to have 50 users. In reality, uh, we got many users. <laughs> and uh, oh, sorry, something happened when I changed the template. Um, here there were some, some data, but we, we have, um, three years of data at any point in time, about um, 3,000 users uh, using the applications and um, millions of records, for example, of accelerometer samples, which is the one that we have already done a lot of analysis on. Um, the application has the user to report uh, various times a day their, um, their mood and uh, also detects their behavior through a bunch of sensors. So, um, this data set is sitting in, um, in Cambridge and um, that's something that, for example, um, might be interesting to look at for the Alan Turing 
Um, the first findings we have, and there is, um, this is not yet online, uh, will probably be soon. Um, this is uh, just a screenshot, I won't give you the details again, but a screenshot of accelerometer um, activity measured as, um, as, a, as a single value, let's say, versus, um, so, so these are clusters of very active users um, so the, this is, we, we, we run uh, a clustering algorithm on the accelerometer data, um, and we came up with three clusters of users. The most active, as you can see, has a sort of, this is uh, on the x-axis, you find the time, time of day, um, and activity. So there's a very active cluster that wakes up a bit later in the weekend, and that's clear from the data. A, a less active cluster of people that is uh, really not as Buzzing, so this is just accelerometer. By activity, I mean just taking the phone in your hands, playing with it, carrying it in your bag, perhaps. And um, a lower cluster um, activity group. It turns out, I, I won't give the numbers here, that these numbers are correlated with the mood reports that user give, giving us a, an initial indication that somehow, even with all the noise of the data, there is a signal that says, you buzzing around with your phone um, is a good thing. It means that you're happier perhaps than other people. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm giving this message with very cautious uh, alerts over here. We also find a correlation, uh, sorry again for x-axis and uh, y-axis missing, um, the users were reporting health and uh, with respect to their um, activity, um, there is um, a, a clear correlation in, in terms of activity or, and health also just uh, if you look at the general statistics of the data. Um, an obvious one which might make you laugh is um, if you look at, uh, again, the grid balance, so the x-axis of the, the matrix that you saw where people were reporting, um, you would find that people uh, were happier when they, they reported to be happier when they were in restaurants and, uh, or family friends' house, other places, and less happy at work. <laughs> um, so um, on, on this particular data set, uh, we are really interested now in going, in going to the next step, but we haven't done it yet. So uh, can we do in person, in, within person analysis and predict the mood based on what we see with, with the data? And that's why we are in that, uh, we have some initial results, but we haven't done, um, we don't, I don't have anything to show you at the moment. One final thing that I think I have the time to uh, present is the fact that we've also tried much earlier than when we set out this application, interesting enough, to use the microphone as a sensor to detect emotions. So the microphone as a sort of recorder. Uh, there are various problems with using the microphone for this purpose. One is the logic of how we match, we do emotion recognition, so the machine learning, the logic needs definitely to stay on the device of size I'm concerned for all sorts of reasons, privacy reasons, um, because it's actually uh, quite um, consuming to send. We've, we've done all sorts of studies on um, how to use all the systems parts of a mobile phone, so GPU, CPU, and as well as uh, the coprocessor that is on the phone, to try to see how much we can use this processing uh, opportunities locally instead of sending things to the cloud. Turns out the GPU is actually very expensive um, in theory, in practice, in some cases to do this sort of analysis is cheaper than sending things to the cloud because of the transmission and the power consumption. So uh, one, one, one other aspect I'm interested in looking at is how to fit logic on these devices so that we can do these things, this, uh, uh, um, uh, this these things uh, better and uh, more privacy aware and local. And uh, yeah, so there, there is a paper that we recently published also on this use of systems. So um, I'll leave my references here in terms of web page where you can find all the papers I've talked about and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, we're doing some work with uh, wearables and uh, they use in sports and how the interaction of uh, sport and health manifests. And 
Okay, what we have noticed is that uh, basically um, the measurements you get, the data you get from accelerometry, uh, have to be uh, looked with a grain of salt. If sure. you are if you are like uh, going to link them to psychological attributes, because what happens is that people. So are you trying to link them to psychological attributes? Yes. Uh, and uh, what what happens is that people who actually generate a lot of accelerometry data are the ones who are more probable to respond to psychological questions. And uh, also people who don't use the wearable devices a lot, and they don't generate accelerometry data, they are less likely to respond to psychological questions. I, I, so I, what happens is that you have to account uh, for this when you start from these conclusions about linking yeah. activity with happiness, activity so, with mood, I, I, yeah. So, uh, you, you're absolutely right, and I, I'd be very interested in reading uh, your work. Um, what we, what our stance here is uh, just look at some very basic signal uh, with a lot, a lot of data from a lot, of, a lot of people. Um, that I, I, I understand that um, looking at more detail uh, might mean that some of these. The, the, I understand there's noise in the data, but I'm also saying that if you look at um, the level of um, accelerometer, the accelerometer level per person in average in this study was very low. So people were not really, we haven't looked at physical activity. And that's the difference with all the studies that have been done. Physical activities meant, you know, you're going to run, you're going to, we are looking at normal people that just take their phones around all day. And, and, and that's, that's the difference, I think, with the studies. I haven't seen what you're referring to, but the difference with the study you're referring to. And here it seems, and I think it's, it's, it actually is intuitive, that um, people that I define it as, people laugh when I do this, have a life. They seem to have something to do with the phone, which means that either they're using it to call people or to interact, or they are traveling and taking it to places. So there, there is a vibration going on. Um, to me, it is intuitive that there is this correlation and we found it, uh, but it, it's obvious. And as I said, I think we, can, we should go into the data and, and, and look more carefully at other things. Physical activity and um, happiness correlation have been found more generally, and I'd be happy to see that even, you have, you even, have to... Even the, even the, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to insist on that, because even the link between happiness and how much you move your phone, your phone mm -hmm. is subject to this phenomenon, right? So, so for so example, which if, people, if people under-report how they feel yes. when they use their phone, when they are not using their phone, Absolutely. it will skew the correlation to your happiness. So, yeah, but how many of the users are you going to have, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, right. so, I don't so the, know the dates of the study. I'm just uh, And, I, and I'm telling you, this, this, these numbers are large. So I think some of the noise you're talking about, or some of the perhaps behavior that some people might have, might be absorbed. But I accept, I fully, look, okay. um, I think we should have more of these studies. This is one. And we, we're kind of shown a path on how you can reach uh, the sort of large populations to go on. Um, psychological studies, um, especially in psychology, you can have um, r repetition of studies for reproducibility is very important. And I think having this sort of data set would help uh, in that sense. We can take it offline perhaps because I think uh, there's no one, but I, I think I still have a couple of minutes. But uh, so I see both faces. I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I, and I, I, I think, um, you know, some parts of this might be that uh, they need adjustment, but I think you know this, we're saying that there is a signal, and and this should this thing should be looked at. And of course, if you then go into detail and look at single people, uh, perhaps a single person, you find certain behaviors, certain groups of population. But this is a large population, and there is a signal that I think might mean something. <laughs> That's all. Um, any other questions? Just one more, and then I shut up. <laughs> Sorry for not taking it earlier. You you say a bit about what you found about the second building that fostered uh, more interaction. 
Yeah, so, so the, it, it was a bit uh, related to the space that was made available to the researchers in the building. Um, they had an internal cafeteria, so people were actually, um, then of course we observed them, they were actually sitting across each other, even if they were different groups, and talking. Uh, which, uh, well, before in the old building, they were perhaps going somewhere, getting food and going back to their clusters. And that helped a lot. Uh, but also, as I said, the different distribution of the floors helped the mingling. Um, definitely was mainly uh, because of the space uh, more than people have changed their interactions. Because there was no change in structure or hierarchical structure, so we couldn't observe any of that. And the spacing was still um, desk allocated, so it's not that hot desking was helping. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop here.